The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. This is the lecture on, on, on sleep and dreams, and uh, you want to know about this because it's, uh, well, at MIT, sleep and dreams is a topic that for, falls under the heading of abnormal psychology. Um, all right, let's, let, let, let us ask to begin, how many people here got some sleep last night? Okay. Of those people, how many people went to sleep even though they knew they still had stuff they wanted to get done? All right, so what's your problem? The, well, the typical MIT answer to that is a, a sort of a moral argument. I'm weak. I'm a, I'm a miserable human being. If I was, if I was a good strong human being, I would not have gone to sleep. I would have done that problem set, um, and, and so on. Um, and uh, if you were not at MIT, and if you were not at, I mean, the MIT is merely at one extreme here. Western civilization in general, increasingly since the invention of the light bulb, has been a sleep, you know, an increasingly uh, sleep abusing, sleep mechanism abusing culture. Um, but if you were left to your own devices, you uh, or to, to what nature had intended, you'd be sleeping about eight hours a night, um, and you would be uh, doing this across your lifespan, with the result that you would spend about a third of your life asleep in this altered state of consciousness or unconsciousness, and that, if you're going to t give a, 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 if you're teaching a course on human behavior and human mental life, that requires some explanation. Why do people sleep? Um, what is the nature of, uh, of, of that behavior uh, and in, in left, left to its normal state? What happens when you abuse it? Um, why do people dream? which is psychologically perhaps the most interesting piece of sleep, and uh, is it possible to get any, uh, do, do those dreams, do those weird stories have any meaning? Uh, those are the questions that I'll, I'll talk about. I don't know if I'll get to the end of it uh, today, otherwise I'll pick up after Thanksgiving. But let's, uh, let's talk initially about uh, why and how you sleep. Um, well, look, I mean, one level of answer would be you sleep because uh, every so often uh, nuclei, collections of nerve cells deep down in your brain stem send volleys of signals up to uh, the rest of your brain that basically uh, make like a hammer and knock you out. Um, but that's not a deeply satisfying answer. But it does point to the fact that it's a very basic drive, and it's a very powerful drive. Look, if you wanted to, you could, for example, as a, uh, you know, as a statement of extreme uh, political conviction, sit right here and starve yourself to death. Hunger is a, a, an important drive. There are several people illustrating that at this very moment. Um, but, but, you know, if you wanted, you can, you, you can override that and not eat, even to the point of killing yourself. Um, that's not true, for example, uh, about your breathing. If you wanted to sit here and hold your breath until you died, <gasps> it wouldn't work. You may have tried this when you were little. Um, <laughs> My sister, one of my one of my two sisters, used to be a, a fan of this. If we were teasing her and chasing her, she would just hold her breath until she keeled over, which was very dramatic, um, but not not in fact life threatening, except in the indirect sense that my mother was not thrilled with us making my little sister pass out. Um, the um, you could ask her; she'll be here tomorrow, but you'll all be leaving anyway. Um, the uh, um, this drive to sleep is 
more like the, 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 the need to breathe than the need to eat in that sense. If you were to sit here and by an act of will declare, I will not fall asleep. I'm look, as you well know, there's a substantial number of you who can't manage to do that for an hour and a half. Um, that has to do with how you're abusing the normal mechanism under... On, on, I used to take this as... A, 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 when I first was teaching, I used to look out at, at, at you know, 10 to 50 full of intro psych students and they're going... <sighs> and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not, I'm not being lively enough here. I realize at this point I could be setting off large explosions on a regular basis and it wouldn't matter for some people. We'll get to that in a minute. But even those of you who are well-rested, um, you could not sit here and not sleep. Probably you couldn't make it for 24 hours. Absolutely you could not make it for 48 hours without external help, um, either from uh, drugs like caffeine or more particularly from somebody smacking you around to keep you awake. Uh, if, you, if you're in a sleep lab and you want to keep somebody awake for 36 hours or something to see what, uh, um, uh, you know, what happens, you sure don't say, I'll give you 10 bucks if you can stay awake all night. You need somebody there to, 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 to you know, slap them around and keep them moving or, or they'll be out. There's, there's just no way to suppress that. It's a very, very powerful, um, very, very powerful drive. So... Um, how come? What's, what's, what's doing this? Um, your need to sleep is driven by two uh, primary factors. One of them is a so-called circadian rhythm. The term comes from circadian is about a day because it's a rhythm with a periodicity of about 24 hours. Um, and if you manage to measure it in isolation uh, and you were to measure something like alertness, it would have a roughly sinusoidal shape to it, this particular drive. Um, when you wake up, it's actually at a relative low point. Well, 6 a.m., yeah, right. At 6 a.m. on this chart, it's at a relative low point. It rises, your alertness driven by the circadian clock, rises systematically uh, during the course of the day until uh, early evening and then declines to a nadir around 4 or 5 in the morning. When you're trying to stay up all night, that time in the wee hours of the morning when it's just really, really tough and you're getting the shakes and all um, is, uh, uh, is when this circadian clock is, is crashing, is hitting, it, is hitting its minimum. Uh, how do we measure this? How do we measure circadian cycles? Well, if you're a, uh, if you're a mouse, it's actually relatively easy. Stick a mouse in a cage with one of those little running wheels and, and um, put a sensor on the running wheel. And you'll get out a graph that looks like the graph that I put on the handout. Each of the lines on that graph is one day. So you've got a day here and the mouse is doing nothing much. And then at a certain point, the mouse jumps on the wheel and does stuff. Now, the... Uh, the convention of um, the circadian trade is to double plot their data. So the, the line is, is the same data plotted twice. It just makes it easier to see trends over the day. So this is inactivity, activity, same day. You know, it, and, and, and so this, this is 24 hours. Um, and you can see that the mouse does this Every day, for day after day, like clockwork, as it were, because um, the mouse has this little clock that's telling it. Now, the, um, the point at which the mouse is firing things up, it, right about here, is um, the, 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 the mouse is on a 12-hour light-dark schedule, and when the lights go out, the mouse turns on. It's a nocturnal beastie, and when the lights go out, he jumps on a wheel and, 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 and goes berserk. Now, what happens um, halfway down that graph where there's an arrow pointing at the uh, side of the data, at that point you leave the lights on continuously. And what you discover is that the, the, uh, the mouse still behaves in a very systematic fashion. I'm not going to bother double plotting my data anymore here. Um, but now the... Uh, 
period is starting to drift. The mouse is now doing what's known as free running. And this is a way that you can take a look at the circadian cycle um, in, in, this, in this beastie, because he's now no longer got the light signal telling him what time it is. And what you discover is that it's advancing by about 30 minutes a day, because the mouse clock has a period, a circadian period, of about 23 and a half hours. Not quite 24 hours. Um, if you were uh, in the same experiment and you were inclined to run around in a, a wheel, um, the data would actually go this way a little bit because the human clock has a period of about 24 and a quarter to 24 and a half hours, some variation. But it's, it's again, around a day. Um, it gets synchronized to the, um, to the real day by light most strongly. So you know when it's morning because that's when the sun comes up. If you never get outside and you live in constant light, your clock may be drifting too in some fashion. But um, given a normal exposure to light-dark cycles, that sets the clock. Uh, how many people are flying across time zones in the next few uh, days? So you guys are all going to be jet-lagged in some fashion because you're gonna, uh, your clock is set for East Coast US. You'll go someplace else. Um, get outside because it's exposure to the sun that will, uh, tip, will reset you. Exposure to these sort of lights will reset you too, but the sun is, su is sufficiently brighter that it makes um, a, a, a bigger difference. Uh, this clock, by the way, has a home. It's uh, located in um, the super chiasmatic nucleus. Uh, looks more complicated than it is. Super for above um, and chiasmatic for uh, the optic chiasm, that X where the optic nerves cross um, in, in the, uh, on, on the way from the eyes to the brain. This sits right on top of that and gets direct input from the retina. It's got its own visual system in a sense and it, 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 it's getting a... Well, now, how do we know? that this is the, where the clock lives. There are a number of ways, but the coolest way that we know that this is where the clock lives is that there are clock mutants out there, um, probably some human, but, but certainly mouse mutants. Um, and suppose you've got a mouse mutant who, let's say, has a clock running at, uh, say, 22 hours or something like that. You can go in, take out the suprachiasmatic nucleus from that mouse, put it into another mouse. And this is a case where a brain transplant will actually work. The recipient mouse will now start running with the clock timing of the, um, of the donor mouse. Um, it's, it's, so you, can, you want a new clock, you can actually go and get I don't know if you can go and get one from a mouse. Um, and probably your, your neighbor doesn't want to donate. Um, but you also have clocks, there are also other clocks, by the way, that, that live in places like your liver. But the main clock running your behavior um, is, uh, is sitting up there in your brain and reset by light and, in fact, can be transplanted, apparently. Um, okay, that's, oh, now, humans don't tend to run in, may, uh, you know, in, in, in little mouse wheels very much. Um, if you want to measure this in a human, if you stick a human in uh, continuous light and cut them off from the external world, which you can get yourself paid to do if you want. One of the uh, leading sleep labs in, in the world, actually, is uh, across the river at Brigham and Women's. Uh, I, my, my lab actually does some collaborating uh, with them, so if you're interested, talk to me. It's a, it, people do this as a summer job. You get locked in the lab for the summer, and uh, um, you know pe people think, oh, I'm going to write the great American novel or something like that while I stay up all night or something. Um, but they, you, you get paid a decent rate for this. Um, now, while you're so, and, and now we're going to want to keep track of what your circadian clock is doing. The sorts of things that vary with your clock are, for example, body temperature. Um, your body temperature has about a one degree uh, plus and minus swing 
with the circadian clock. Um, so if you've got a fever, for example, you can probably remember from when you were a little kid that your fever would peak in the early evening. Um, and if you stay up all night, it's four in the morning where you suddenly feel chill. That's because your body temperature is actually varying as, uh, as a function of the circadian cycle. Uh, there are lots of um, uh, circulating hormones like melatonin and others in the blood that also track the circadian clock. So if um, you're in the lab, um, somebody is going to be monitoring these various aspects of your physiology in an effort to take a look at where your circadian clock is. Um, this is one of the things that sort of discourages people from immediately signing up because, well, for instance, if you're going to be taking continuous measures of body temperature, the thermometer is not under your tongue. Um, the, uh, <laughs> it's a slow group. <laughs> the, uh, anyway, so you, you can... Uh, um, the, so you, you've got, got the circadian clock that's driving your alertness. And um, the other piece that's driving your alertness, your dri or, or inversely, this drive, this powerful drive to sleep, is, is uh, sometimes called the sleep homeostat. It's simply a homeostatic mechanism that says the longer you're awake, the more tired you get. Um, this is not a huge surprise. Um, so we can graph that here. So this is, again, alertness. Let's say this is 6 a.m. again. Now let's, let's say that you wake up at something like 8. And basically, as a roughly linear function of uh, during the day, um, you get sleepier and sleepier and sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. This thing builds up pressure to sleep. If you now go to sleep at, let's say, 11, that recovers. It recovers at least initially rather steeply and then um, and, and it probably has a sort of an exponential tail. It's not absolutely... Um, not absolutely clear. Um, but if you combine these two, well, if you were combi to combine these two in the way that nature intended, um, what you get is a sustained period of, um, let's look at the course of the day. Suppose you wake up in the, in the relatively early morning. Your, um, your circadian uh, clock is push it, is relatively depressed, so it's it's still feeling kind of sleepy, but your um, your homeostat is fully refreshed. So you're up here, let's say, in alertness land, and now as the homeostat is going down, the circadian chunk is going up, and so for a sustained period of the day, say till early evening, you have roughly level alertness. <coughs> Believe it or not, that's what really happens to people who are pretty well rested. They are awake during the day. <laughs> Sometime in early evening, when that, um, uh, when that clock starts to, uh, well, when the circadian clock turns downward, uh, things start going downhill for you and your alertness starts uh, steadily dropping. And at some point, it drops enough that, uh, that you, well, that people who are not abusing the system go to sleep. At which point, um, so now, um, now when you're, so, so you're not, now, now you're asleep, so you're not terribly alert. So what, what's, what's happening now is, so you're down here in a sleep land somewhere, um, now your homeostat is recovering, right? But in the early portions of your sleep, um, well, or, or during the course of the night, the circadian thing is still crashing down. So even though you may have climbed up here already on the homeostat, you're crashing down to here, and the circadian thing is saying, stay asleep, stay asleep, it's good for you, you should be asleep for this, like, sustained eight hours. And then it turns around in the early, in the early morning hours, and... You know, 4, 5, 6 a.m., you wake with the chickens, and you're bright and perky and alert like you are every morning. Um, and, you know, you're back. So what you get out of this system, if it's being allowed to work properly, is a sustained period of alertness during the day and a sustained bout of sleep during the night. If you crash the circadian um, system, for instance, 
uh, you end up with broken sleep. Um, in, so, so if you, if you, you blow, blow up a, 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 um, a, a mouse's circadian clock, um, and what you get is a mouse who runs and naps and runs and naps and runs and naps, doesn't have this organized pattern to it. Um, now, the great tragedy, of course, is that you guys who are in the peak of your ability to do this aren't doing it. Um, right? You're just abusing the, you're abusing the pants off. The, 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 the structure of sleep changes over the course of the lifespan. Um, babies sleep for a lot longer than, uh, than adults do. Um, after early childhood, they, uh, people have a fairly constant requirement for about eight hours. The, the, the range is really about seven to nine hours. People who say they uh, require only four hours of sleep or something like that are basically lying to you. Um, the, uh, and, 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 you know, Thomas Edison, right? I, he's, he's always trotted out as an example here. I don't remember what he needed. Two hours a night, four hours a night. Well, there was a reason the man had a cot in his office. Um, the people who don't sleep eight hours at night are catching naps when they can and are building up a sleep debt the rest of the time. Um, and, and the sleep debt is a serious... If, if you are dement... Uh, uh, William Dement is one of the whoops, not Dement Dement Stanford sleep researcher uh, coined the term sleep debt I think um, argues that it may be the biggest health problem in the US why is that? well because all sorts of stuff from traffic accidents to industrial accidents and so on um, occur uh, in, well basically in, in the wee hours of the morning when the circadian clock is busy um, crashing uh, because sleepiness is not good for, for behavior, uh, as you may have noticed in, in, in various and sundry ways. Um, when you get older, it turns out to get harder to maintain, for reasons we don't really understand, to maintain this consolidated period of sleep. So, um, it is a sad fact that uh, I, for instance, do not typically manage to sleep eight hours solidly, at anything like eight hours solidly at a stretch um, anymore, uh, even though I have long ago abandoned my various efforts to abuse the system. I'd love to sleep, you know, a solid, well, seven would be happy enough, but as you get older, it's harder to maintain it. You can do it now, and you're not doing it. It's so sad. Um, so, what are you doing, and why are you so deluded? Well, in part, you're, uh, you're, you're being deluded by this circadian clock, because what happens? You stay up all night, right? So uh, where shall we plot this? Well, we'll we, uh, we don't have any colors. Okay, so we, we're, we're going we're gonna, to... You're, you're, you're alert. Here, we'll, we'll do this. Let, let's assume that you were once well-rested, like before you arrived at MIT or something. Um, and and you, 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 you stay up all night. Um, so you were, you were doing fine till here, and now you're going to stay up. On. We're getting sleepier here. Uh, well, you know, there's the coffee, uh, and the jolt cola, uh, and uh, who knows what else smacking you around, and you know, stuff happens, um, and, and, but you're, you know, you're fighting a losing battle here, and it's four in the morning, and, and you're, you're barely holding on, and let me tell you that, 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 that you know, psych paper that you're writing at that point is not your best work, um, but... So there it goes, four in the morning, but six, seven in the morning, you've been up all night, and what happens? The circadian clock turns around, right? I did it! I did it! I don't need to sleep! I'm so good! You know, I'm a real MIT student. This is, this is great, but it's, it's all fake. Um, it's just, it's just the, you know, and, and you, you think you're getting back up here. Forget it, man. You're, you're in here somewhere. Oh, pump, psych class. And so you're ambling around in this business. If you do, if you think that this is great evidence that 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 you, you know, I'm Superman and I don't need to sleep, um, try it the second night. Right. I don't know how many of you have ever tried staying awake two nights. The, the, the way to stay awake two nights in a row um, is to have somebody shooting at you. Uh, leading leading uh, funders of sleep research 
uh, our, our army and air force. And they have a very particular interest. Their interest is, well, they have sort of two interests. One of the, the army interest is, you know, we're going to take over this country in a hundred hours straight and our boys ain't going to sleep until it's done. Um, and we don't want any ill effects of this. Um, and, and got some good drugs for us. We need drugs. We want good drugs. Um, that's, that's sort of the army research program. The Air Force says, we can fly at night. This is cool. We've got really cool toys. We can fly at night. It's really bad when the helicopter guy falls asleep. Right? So we, want, we need him to stay awake at, at, at you know, bad times. So they, 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 they're big time funders of, of, uh, of, of this kind of stuff. It is the fact that um, you know, the sort of thing, your general level of arousal will, will, will keep you up. And so the, the, the panicked sense that you're going to flunk psych if you don't finish the paper will do some good. Uh, the panic sense that if you fall asleep, somebody's going to shoot you does a lot of good. Right? People, uh, you, you can stay awake for a long time un, under, uh, under that basis. But, um, uh, but you know, it, it's not that you miraculously, if you just can make it past here, you get back up here. It, 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 it's, it's this thing, if you don't keep recovering, it just keeps going. <laughs> and eventually, eventually, you're going to fall asleep. It's just, it's just going to, it's just going to happen to you. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, that's the broad, uh, sort of, 24-hour scale of um, sleep. Within that, there's a structure on, uh, on top of that. Now, uh, you, this, this is a, Sort of a nine, I'm not going to draw this accurately, but there's a sort of a 90-minute ripple sitting on top of this circadian clock um, that runs all day and throughout uh, 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 and while you're asleep. You know this during the day by the uh, by the variations that what what you may have noticed were reliable fluctuations in your own own alertness during the day. Um, and in fact, we can probably you you, you can probably do this. I should collect data on this some year. I'll have to make up a little questionnaire. Um, the clock is about 90 minutes. This lecture is about 90 minutes. Um, so sometime during this lecture, you're, uh, y you'll hit the nadir of that 90 minute cycle. And uh, well, I actually, I can at least ask the, the, uh, uh, the general question. How many people think they could identify um, within plus or minus 15 minutes the point during um, an average intro psych lecture where they're, go where, where they're going to, uh, if they're going to lose it, is where they're going to lose it. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 that's, you know, many, many of us know that there are just chunks of time that are bad. And you might notice, if you check out, if, if, if you were to systematically survey those during the course of the day, of course it interacts with things like when you eat your meals, when you get up, whether you ever got to sleep last night, and things like that. But you may be able to peg a series of these spaced out at 90 minutes or maybe 180 minutes during the course of the day. Um, you see these at night too. And let's see, let's find myself another board here. Go away. What's, what, what do we got under here? Um, to talk about that, let's fill out this cute little chart on the, on the handout. If I just stick a bunch of electrodes on your head and record the electroencephalogram, the mass potentials off of your, uh, uh, off of, you know, billions of neurons in your brain, um, what I will see grossly is high frequency, low amplitude stuff while you are awake. So this is EEG. Depending on where I, where I put my electrode in the brain, I can get a lot of, uh, on the scalp rather, I can get a lot of other interesting information out of it. But for present purposes, the important thing is that the mass activity of the brain is relatively high frequency, low amplitude um, stuff. If I now take a look at you when you are deeply asleep, what I will find is low amplitude, uh, low frequency, high amplitude waves, roughly corresponding to um, the, well, what's, what's going on is that uh, uh, in deep sleep, large bodies of neurons are firing together. 
um, everybody's on, then everybody's off. And if you're woken up out of that state, that's the, I don't know where I am, kind of state. They are. You're, 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 deeply, you're deeply asleep here. Um, the interesting thing, discovered now about 50 years ago, is that um, every 90 minutes or so, you'll go into what we will call rapid eye movement sleep for reasons that will be apparent in the next line of this table, um, where all of a sudden the brain goes back to this high frequency, uh, low amplitude um, kind of signal. Now, research over the course of the 50 years makes it clear that this is not exactly the same as this, but it certainly looks awake-like. And, but this, the person is still clearly asleep. The interesting thing is that if you wake somebody up out of this state, they will reliably report that they are dreaming. Not all the time. Um, if you wake people up out of this state, they will reliably report that they are not dreaming. Again, not all the time. Some t- uh, it, it's not a perfect divide. But lots of narrative dreaming here. Here you tend to get, if you wake people up and say what was going on, you might get an isolated thought or some you know, idea that was rattling around, but you won't get that you know, I was flying naked through the infinite corridor with a panda on my back or something, <laughs> kind of. We'll talk about that later. Um, the, uh, so, and, and, and this, this is the nighttime manifestation of that, uh, of that 90, um, of that 90 minute cycle that you also see running during the, uh, the course of the day. You can pick that up in the movements of the eyes too. That's the electrooculogram. Um, while you are awake, your eyes move um, ballistically. If this is say, to the, whoops, not to the four, to the left and to the right, your eyes are sitting in one place then jumping someplace else and moving around like so. And the two eyes are moving together, so-called consensual eye movements. In deep sleep, those ballistic movements, called saccades, disappear, and the consensual movements um, are are damped down to, so the eyes are kind of rolling around in your head, and they're not necessarily rolling in the same place. When you go into rapid eye movement sleep, the reason it was called rapid eye movement sleep is because the eyes look like they're awake again. So again, ballistically jumping around and jumping together is the pattern of eye movements related to to what's going on in in, uh, your dream. Well, there's anecdotal evidence for it, but if you think about it, it's very difficult to do the experiment in in any terribly... uh, um, meaningful. Well, actually, there's some interesting data in, in, uh, in animals at this point that suggests maybe it is. But in any case, the eyes look like they're awake here. The eyes um, uh, uh, you know, doing the same thing that they were doing when, when they were awake. Uh, you can see this um, in, uh, you know, in your roommate, if your roommate, particularly if your roommate has relatively uh, thin, uh, thin lids. Um, you can often see the eyes moving around under the lids. And if you watch your sleeping roommate, um, your sleeping roommate may think you're a weirdo when he or she wakes up. But you can uh, you can actually see the eyes jerking around um, under the uh, under the lids. Um, and sometimes, and if you have a uh, an unusual roommate who sleeps with the eyes open, um, this is, this actually happens. The, re- the 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 reason for sleeping with your eyes closed. Um, has less to do with, uh, you know, presumably has something to do with cutting the light out, but it has mostly to do with keeping the, the, the cornea hydrated, keeping it moist um, while you're asleep. If you sleep with your eyes open, you wake up with you know, nasty, scratchy, itchy eyeballs. Uh, because if you think about it, you, 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 do, you don't sleep with your ears closed. <laughs> it's perfectly possible to use um, your, your brain in some fashion to shut off the uh, enough of the ambient outside stimulus to go to sleep, to you know, get, get rid of the auditory stimulus. So in principle, you could do that with your eyes too. Um, but you close your eyes to keep them nice and moist. So some people, that doesn't work terribly. I traveled across France in a train with a guy who fell asleep, but he, he was, his, his eyes were open. 
and it's like traveling across France with the undead. <laughs> because, you know, at some point he went into REM sleep and you know, his eyes are going all over the place. But he ain't looking at nothing that's there. And it's, it was a little strange. Um, so, so far, awake and dreaming sleep look the same. There is, uh, there's one place where that, uh, in case you're having trouble telling whether your roommate's actually asleep, um, here's how you can tell. You measure muscle, muscle tone, electromyogram. Um, when you are as, uh, awake, your muscles are on, right? You have good muscle tone. That's why your head doesn't fall off of your shoulders, and then you, you know, I can stand upright and stuff like that. Um, when, you are, uh, when you are in deep sleep, um, actually, your muscles remain on. The muscle tone remains high. It's when you go into REM sleep that you lose muscle tone. You can see this um, in your friendly neighborhood cat. Your cat, because all this stuff shows up in, in widely in mammalian species. So, your cat who's sleeping like this, that's a deeply sleeping cat whose muscle tone is doing just fine, thank you. Your cat who's sleeping like that is a cat who is in REM sleep and, 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 and has, lost, um, has lost muscle tone. All right, uh, now, why, why, why would you turn the muscles off in REM sleep? Yeah, yeah. I, I, Yeah, yeah. If, you, if, you, if you're busy being Superman and leaping tall buildings in a single bound in your dreams, it's a really good idea if you don't actually try that out. Um, and and not, not only are you protecting um, yourself, you're protecting anybody else you happen to be sleeping with. Um, a known sleep disorder in older men um, is that this uh, blockade of voluntary muscles fades off. And the result, and, and this is a known disorder because older women bring the older men to the doctor because their husband is thrashing around in the middle of the night and whacking her. Um, and, and, and this is a real problem. People get hurt. Um, so you want, you want the muscles to, uh, to go off. There are a number of corollaries here. It turns out that, that sleepwalking, um, Shakespeare has it wrong. Lady Macbeth is clearly dreaming about having murdered Duncan and all that when she's sleepwalking. Typically, sleepwalking is not acting out your dreams. It is, um, it is a version of, of, of non-REM sleep. Um, where, uh, and, and much more typical in children than in adults. And I don't... How many, how many of you know that you used to walk around at night when you were... Um, we, we, you know, little, little kids wandering around. Their eyes are open. They can, uh, but, 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 you know, nobody's home here. Um, and I, I, my, I don't know how. I, I, I don't know, actually know that much about it. My, my theory is that part of what's doing this is it's, it, it's your, your bladder telling you to get up, um, and, and the rest of your brain saying we want to stay asleep here. Um, my theory is based on one of the great moments of child rearing in my household, um, which was one of my uh, children. We, we were awakened in the middle of the night, my wife and I, by one of my sons yelling, No! Not here! <laughs> to the other son, who was uh, about to use a trash can for the wrong purpose. Um, and <laughs> And he was, he, he, we, anyway, we, it, it all worked out in the end. Um, but this is, this is a deep sleep phenomenon. Uh, talking in your sleep is often apparently talking out of, out of, it, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, you know, you, you, you're not going to hurt yourself too much if you, um, uh, if you don't blockade your, uh, if you don't blockade your jaw. Right? It's the main, the main body muscles that are the real threat. And so sometimes people will end up talking in their sleep, um, often to the amusement of other people in the room, um, or, 
to the inconvenience of other people or of your own relationships if what you're talking about in your sleep is somebody else other than the person <laughs> who's currently present with you. Um, anyway, it's not clear this well. We get that to, when we get to meaning of dreams, we can talk about this. Anyway, so this is this is the sort of um, within the circadian cycle. This is the sort of structure you get in um, in 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 sleep. And um, is there anything else? Oh, now it's, 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 there's there's much more to this than what I'm telling you. Deep sleep can be subdivided into multiple stages. That, uh, that differ in the, the activity of different parts of your brain and, um, and so on. Um, within, so now between this, where the, between that 24 hour cycle and this 90 minute cycle, there is uh, yet another level of, of structure to a night's sleep where there's more non REM, slow wave, deep sleep early in the night. If you have a consolidated bout of eight hours of sleep, a normal night's sleep, what you will see is more, more of this stuff early in the night and more of this stuff later in the night. And this is accompanied by systematic changes in, um, in the neurochemistry of the sleeping brain and, and, uh, and so on. So that there's an intermediate level of structure to, um, uh, to sleep also. The impression one gets is of a beautifully structured system that is designed to do something. So, I mean, apart from uh, the, the obvious, it's designed to keep you from feeling sleepy, one wants to know, well, what is, uh, what is sleep for? Um, what's, what's the, the, you, you, you'd be surprised if a third of your life was spent in this state for no good reason. So, oh, look at that. It says part two. Why do we sleep? Um, and, and it suggests that there are several possible reasons here. Uh, anybody care to offer any possible theories of, uh, of why we sleep? Nobody's got a clue. Yes. Okay, so, so there's a sort of a, a basic rest and regeneration notion, right? They made, you know, you, you used your muscles all day, you built up um, all those metabolic byproducts in, in, in muscles that you learned about once upon a time. Sleep, rest will give you a chance to, um, to clear that out. So certainly one possibility is it's an enforced rest period. You could enforce rest some other way, presumably, um, but this, this is, well, you could, you could, you could, know, you could, it could be good for you to rest, period, just lie around and do nothing. But sleep kind of enforces that. Yes, there was a hand over there somewhere, yeah. Okay, so there's a whole class of theories, and these are actually the, 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 um, the ones where there's, uh, I suppose, the most current interest that have to do with learning and memory, that somehow what, what sleep is, is about is um, uh, tuning up your memories and, uh, and, and or consolidating, you know, consolidating memories, improving learning or something like that. Something, well, let, let's talk about more about that in a minute, but if you're sitting there saying, I'm a real MIT student, I don't need to sleep, you might worry about theories that say sleep is vital to the consolidation of memory. Um, there was, uh, yeah? It's a lot easier to cut during the day, so we don't need to waste all the energy. Yeah, okay, so another possibility is energy conservation. Um, you could be awake all of the time, um, but if you, if, if, if you can't hunt when it's dark, you might as well go and, uh, and, and, and be, you know, uh, power down the disk drive or something like that and, 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 uh, um, and not use as much energy. Your brain's pretty active while you're asleep, as you may gather from this, but the rest of you, of course, is getting, getting some rest. Um, anything else? Any other good possibilities? Um, along with that uh, uh, um, uh, energy saving one, you can, well, well here, we can, we can motivate this, this one related to energy saving by asking, um, where do you sleep when it gets dark? In bed, that seems like a good place. Where did you put your bed? 
Burr, 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 Burr. Uh, any, any, anybody big on, on, you know, sleeping on, on, on like the, you know, putting their bed out on the sidewalk, or, you know, those of you who are hunter gatherers, um, you know, you, 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 you just, when you're tired, you just lie down in the middle of the field. No, because it's not really very safe. So another possibility is that you want to sleep um, for purposes of protecting yourself um, at times that are, that is, 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 as, as a corollary of this, you can't hunt all day thing. Um, there are, are other things out there that um, have adapted themselves to the niche that you are not in, like they hunt at night. So if you're not going to hunt at night, not only do you want to be calm and quiet, you want to be out of the way. Because otherwise, oh look, he's asleep. Let's eat him. Um, so there's a sort of a safety aspect to it. Oh, the other part of the safety aspect is that not only don't you want to hunt at night, if you just go wandering around aimlessly at night, you're going to fall in a hole and hurt yourself. So better get in the hole first and go to sleep. Um, let's see, do I have any other brilliant theories here that I wanted to... Mentioned. That's pretty good. You guys managed to do a quick survey of the leading theories. Um, as I say, a lot of the cool current data is on this issue. Uh, it, it centers around this idea of um, uh, sleep having a role in learning. And um, let me let me let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the picture that's on the handout is an illustration. Uh, what looks like a really trivial um, task. The question is, is there a little uh, vertical region in that display somewhere? The answer is, well, yeah. Uh, now, I can make that task arbitrarily difficult by, um, uh, by flashing the stimulus very briefly and following it with a mask of some sort. So I can, um, uh, I, I, can, I can make it hard. I can make it as hard as I like. And um, if I do that, what I can do is measure um, a, uh, let's call it a, a, a threshold uh, time. So may, maybe in order for you to get this task correct, 70% of the time, I initially need to have the stimulus on for 200 milliseconds. Um, if you practice it for a while, you'll get better. And, um, and that, that'll, that'll level off at some point. What a number of people have, uh, well, Sagi and, is it Carney and Sagi, I think? Dub Sagi is the guy I know. Um, what a number of people found starting, I think, with Carney and Sagi, is that um, if you let people sleep, in particular if they are allowed to have REM sleep, um, that performance gets... Well, here, let's have them sleep for eight hours here. That performance gets better. As if something happened while they were asleep. If, you, if they don't sleep during this period, they don't get better. So it's a sleep-dependent improvement in behavior. This is a very specific little bit of learning. This isn't just a general overall improvement in behavior. If you train people with that little vertical patch, so you may, maybe you're doing a task, is, is that region vertical or horizontal, right? That the three thingies vertical or three thingies horizontal. Yeah, and it's always, I'm looking here, and it's always down and to my left. I learn to be faster here. I don't learn to be faster here. And the, uh, the improvement in learning is specific to the little piece of retina that I have trained. So it's very, very specific um, sort of learning that seems to be dependent on, uh, on, on getting a decent night's uh, sleep. Now, um, interestingly, there is evidence how many people here are nappers? <laughs> How many people here are nappers just because it happens? Um, the, uh, the, oh, I, 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 we, we can do it this way. Uh, how many people here uh, think that if they take a nap in the middle of the day, uh, they wake up feeling better for the experience? 
How many people think if they have a nap, um, they, they, they wake up feeling cruddy for, for the rest of the day? So, yeah, it's, it's, it, we don't quite, uh, there are people who find naps to be uh, refreshing and useful, and there are people who, who find it to be disruptive. Um, it was certainly a big improvement in my professional life when I reached the level where I had an office of my own. Um, be, and and the, the biggest part of that was it made napping a great deal um, more graceful. Right? After lunch, I could take the latest issue of Vision Research um, a, and, 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 and prop it up and stare at the same two sentences for like 15 minutes. And, and I feel much better thereafter. Um, the, um, there is evidence that a properly timed nap uh, is just about as good as a night's sleep for this sort of perceptual learning. This is work done by uh, Sarah Mednick, originally up at Harvard. Um, and uh, this, is, this is new stuff. We don't really quite understand fully how, to understand, you know, how far we can take this. It's the sort of thing that your average MIT student um, is tempted to take and run with, right? Oh man, I can get the whole benefit of eight hours of sleep if I just go for nine, I think it's 90 minutes um, between like two and three in the afternoon. That works. Great. Now I can stay up all night and do it. Anyway, we don't know that yet. But Mednick's study is an interesting suggestion that sleep during, uh, napping sleep can serve this uh, same sort of perceptual learning kind of role. Um, but look, um, it, uh, one might actually wonder whether anybody other than vision researchers cares about whether or not you can find little briefly flashed lines in one corner of your visual field. That's not what you want to know about learning and memory. What you want to know is, is anything really useful happening while you're asleep. In particular, the sorts of things, one of the things, things that people want to know is, um, you know, can you do serious thinking in your sleep? One thing you can't do uh, is, is to study in your sleep. So um, there have been endless efforts, because people smelled money at the far end of this, um, to produce, like, tapes that you could stick under the pillow, you know, record Gleitman, and why waste precious waking hours um, reading Gleitman? I'll just have somebody else read it to me while I'm asleep. Sorry. This overwhelming evidence is that nothing happens. The mild effects that, uh, that are sporadically shown here um, come from periodic awakenings during the night. Um, and that, that also goes for sleeping through the lecture. Um, if you're sound asleep during the lecture, it's lovely that you were here, but uh, um, you'll have to ask somebody else what actually happened. Um, so that doesn't work. But can you have insights? Or can, can you do your problem sets during uh, uh, your, your sleep in some sense? How, how, many, how many people have had the experience of being sort of dead-ended on a problem? Yeah, it's yeah, time to just give it up. You go to sleep and you wake up and somehow the answer kind of seems to be there? It's a not uncommon experience. And there are lots of anecdotes in the, in the literature about this. Uh, one of the famous ones is the guy who, dis, uh, who first described uh, the, the ring structure of benzene, claims that he had a dream of a snake biting his tail and he woke up knowing that benzene was a ring or something uh, like that. It doesn't always work, by the way. My father is a... Um, uh, spent his career as a physicist and um, well, had, had the same experience. He's working on a problem, not getting anywhere. Goes to sleep, wakes up in the middle of the night. He knows the answer. And, and, and he knows you, you don't remember stuff from the middle of the night, so he writes it down fast and pop, goes back to sleep. Gets up the next morning, as predicted, has no recollection of what the great answer was, but he does remember writing it down, which is good. So he looks at it and he sees that the answer is all the world is suffused with the smell of cinnamon. <laughs> Which I'm sure was an answer but wasn't necessarily the, the, uh, the answer 
he was looking for. Um, but so this has this this notion that you could actually be doing something productive in that sense during sleep was a um, uh, was was really in the realm of anecdote until this year um, when I, I put the reference on the paper by uh, by these, this group in Germany. Um, led by, I suppose, since he's in Germany, it must be Wagner et al. Um, beautiful experiment. You know these uh, uh, number games where you, you, know, you get a string of numbers and you have to predict the next number in the series? Um, well, I can't, can't remember the particular one here, which is just as well, because at MIT, all that would happen is if I presented it, you'd be sitting there for the rest of the lecture trying to work out what's the rule here, <laughs> Anyway, it's a, it's a clever... You go look at the paper. It's a beautiful paper. Um, but uh, it, they, they picked one of these things where there were two ways to solve it. There is a sort of a laborious multi-step thing. You know, you add the last two numbers and then divide by the third back number. And yeah, it's some weird thing. And you can do it, but it takes a long time. And so if you measure the amount of time for, here, so this is going to be time again. Measure the amount of time to get the answer. People are initially very long, and then they get better, and you know, okay, and you get better, and you get to some sort of stable level. But, there's a trick. And if you have this flash of insight, you realize, I don't remember what, but there's some trivial way of knowing what the number is. And if you get it, it's trivial to see in the data because whoosh, your time drops like a rock and it stays there. Okay? So, now what you do is you take people, you train them on this, and they're, they're, uh, and they're sitting, they're, they're at this the, 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 the high asymptote here, and you send them away. You either send them away for eight hours of daytime stuff, come back tonight and we'll test you again, you send them away, um, I don't remember, did they actually keep them in the lab? You can keep them in the lab and keep them awake. Or anyway, they don't, you send them away at night because you want to make sure that it's not just a day-night thing. But don't let them sleep. Or you have people who go to sleep um, and have eight, eight hours worth of sleep. And the finding is that the next day, you know, some people, are, or the, you know, eight hours later, rather, some people are here, some people are here or, or rapidly get here, um, and 50% more of the people who had a night's sleep got here. Um, it's not that everybody went to sleep and had this kaboom of insight, but seemingly something about that night's sleep produced um, a, a, this, this, this rapid burst of insight in many more people in the... Uh, in, in the sleep group than in the two other, uh, two other groups. And it's, I think, the first really good evidence, experimental evidence, for an ability to get, um, uh, get something uh, more like higher level cognitive thought happening while you're, you're asleep, not just these uh, relatively low level perceptual learning kinds of things. So the, the, oh, the, General evidence suggests that sleep has an important role to play in managing your, uh, your cognitive life in, in some fashion. It probably serves a role in consolidating memory. It probably serves uh, a, a role in, um, in problem solving. Uh, it, it certainly is the sort of thing that one might think about as one is saying... I'm going to stay up all night reading Gleitman because tomorrow's the final exam. It might not be absolutely... Well, if, if you haven't read Gleitman before the final exam, it's probably true that reading Gleitman all night is better than hoping that eight hours of sleep will produce a flash of insight about the imagined contents of Gleitman. Um, but, uh, but... Well, all right, let us discuss... All right, I'm supposed to tell you what's going to happen when you're sleep deprived, I see. But let's do that in uh, a minute after, you know, you wake up the person next to you who's dozed off. Because they want to hear this piece. Uh,
were talking about, how um, the ships are garment, and, you know, you don't really have an insight, you can't really study at night. Um, how are all these, like, there are all these stories about, like, Liszt and all these famous composers who would actually keep their glasses and keep their notepads right next to them because they write, like, half their greatest music? Oh, oh, no, the fact that my father thought that the world was a beautiful <laughs> scale of cinnamon doesn't mean that you don't wake up in the middle of the night with an honest to goodness first <laughs> inspiration. It just means that there's it, it's, it's not some sort of a privileged state that guarantees it. Is anybody interested in calling me or just my kid? Well, since I'm in the middle of the break, I'll just check who this is. Hello? Hello, hello? Bye, goodbye. Okay. Nobody call me. You had something good. All right. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, can I please let that know the problem? You got to add this class earlier. I've been sitting in lecture and doing all the papers. So, can you send a little ask for me? This happened on drop data. Oh, sorry. Okay, it's off today. Oh, no, it's off Wednesday. And that was when oh, and you suddenly discovered it. Uh, I support this with an instructor statement. Um, and, 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 yeah, you seem to, I, I recognize you. You've been around. Whose recitation are you in? Um, What is today? The 23rd? I won't write. I support this petition, even though the guy is a bozo who should clearly get more sleep. <laughs> yeah, probably, thanks. No, that's just... Isn't that like kind of your You'll keep recharging the homeostat. You're, not, you're gonna still lose it to the, uh, the circadian piece. But yeah, I mean, you, you can spread out the eight hour demand over the course of, of the day. If you, uh, uh, people typically find it harder to fall asleep during the, the day. Um, but, uh, but you know, you can do that. And like, uh, I've had this tendency, like, to actually be able to have conversations with someone. Like, I've been out with someone in my life. Like, there, 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 are all sorts of, there are all sorts of liminal borderline states between being awake and being asleep. And when you're, you're talking to somebody while you're uh, asleep nominally, it, it, it's, it's one of these sort of borderline states. I think, uh, let, let's talk after class. Can we do that? Okay, well, tell me quickly, because you, you're, you're waving a paper at me and you're not yeah. happy. This is to be took on 20 points for the few citations that I can play by day. It's a question of day, and I know that... Okay, so look, the, a- the answer... It's a very serious accusation from him, but I know that I, I cited as much as I need to in this paper. Well, that, have you talked to him about it? I emailed somebody after this one. Which him are we talking about? Uh, Paul Sears. Uh, Paul um, You should talk to him first about it. Um, typically, people have been, uh, the, the, the TAs have been saying um, there are ways to get back those particular points, the, the citation points. Talk to him and then talk to me about it. Okay. Um, can we? Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so what happens to you? You were clearly built to sleep. What happens if you abuse the privilege and you're running a sleep debt? Um, and the answer is most people here, and in fact, most people in, in America are running some sort of a sleep debt. Um, what is, what is the, uh, uh, the cost? Um, well, you can measure costs in a variety of different ways. You can certainly measure um, costs in, in, a, in, a, uh, in terms of things like um, uh, industrial accidents, car crashes, and stuff like that. The classic um, sleep deprivation car crash is a crash on a uh, clear, straight road uh, on, a, on a moonlit night. You know, you're a nice long distance trucker who's abusing the rules about how long you're supposed to be able to drive at once. You know, and you're, you're out, there's no car in the vicinity, the, the, the road is straight, the, it's, the, it's not bright light, but you know, you can see everything. The road turns a few degrees and you don't, straight out into the cactus or something like that. Because um, you, uh, when you get really sleepy, if you take a look at people's brain waves, you can watch them flipping into these little micro-sleeps um, that don't necessarily last very long, but at 60 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, they don't need to last very long for you to end up in the, uh, in, in, in the sagebrush. Um, there are plenty of ways to measure it in the lab, too. If you sit somebody 
who uh, sit somebody in the lab and tell them, all I want you to do is push a button when I turn on a, um, this little light. It's the only thing you need to do. Um, what you discover is that people are about uh, 200 milliseconds slower at adverse circadian phase, at the bottom of that circadian trough, than they are um, at the top of it. Um, and um, on top of that just general slowing, there are also a whole bunch of times when they'll just miss the light altogether. You know, the light will come on, and, and um, you know, the subject will be just... Um, and, and not do anything about it. Now, 200 milliseconds. Oh, what's the big deal um, there? You know, it's only a fifth of a second. Well, again, at, at, at 90 miles an hour, it makes a difference. And if you're flying your, your, your supersonic jet around uh, you know, the skies of Iraq or something, it makes even more of a difference. Um, so there's a generalized slowing. Um, there is uh, a tendency to trade off uh, speed and accuracy more than usual in favor of speed. So people tend, when, when they're sleepy, if the, uh, we, we've actually done this in, in, in our lab, so if you're doing one of these visual searchy kinds of things where you're looking for something exciting like where's the red vertical line, um, people, if you go too fast, you make mistakes. People, when they're sleepy, tend to be willing to tolerate higher error rates. Again, that's the sort of thing that, that uh, brought out into the real world if your error rate goes up by uh, you know, two or three times, um, that can be a real problem in doing, in doing real world tests. Um, it is harder to prove, but pretty clear, perhaps introspectively, that, that, um, that being sleepy makes you stupid. Uh, you just don't think as, as well. Um, for a long time, it was kind of hard to show any effects of sleep deprivation because people tended to do things like um, ask you to add up columns of numbers. And as long as I smack you around enough to keep you awake during the task, you can do that. Um, but if I ask you to do, oh, I don't know, you know, your problem set when you're really sleepy, it turns out that the throughput on more complicated cognitive tasks um, goes uh, goes downhill. Um, you're just not as good at it. Will it kill you? Um, you know, how bad can it be? The answer is uh, probably yes. Um, not, not obviously at the level that, 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 uh, that people inflict on themselves, but prolonged sleep deprivation will kill you if you are a rat, at least. Um, and what kills you is not that you just get so sleepy that you fall over dead, but that, um, but that, the, that staying awake, or more to the point, being kept awake, which is, of course, what's required if you're going to go for uh, an extended period of sleep deprivation, is highly stressful. And stress will kill you. Um, the rats who die in sleep deprivation studies die of things like bleeding ulcers and, and stuff like that. Uh, symptoms that look for all the world like the, um, the effects of, um, of severe stress. Um, you can also ask whether or not uh, deprivation of particular kinds of sleep is particularly damaging. Um, so, for example, it's relatively easy to deprive somebody of REM sleep. You can just monitor their, uh, their eye movements or their, or, or their um, brain waves and uh, wake them up every time they go into REM sleep, and, and they will sleep for most of the night that way, but they won't have... Uh, they'll have little or no REM. You do get effects of that on perceptual, on these perceptual learning tasks. REM seems to be important um, in that. Uh, but you can be REM deprived for an extended period of time without uh, collapsing in a heap. Um, there are two reasons we know that. One of them is that people have done experimental studies of this. The other is that one class of antidepressants known as monamine oxidase inhibitors, um, MAO. MAOIs um, systematically suppress REM sleep um, and these, these patients report that they don't dream and, but they don't have obvious evil side effects. We don't quite understand how that relates to these theories. They, they, people on these things don't say, oh my goodness, I can't learn anymore. 
So there's something we don't understand about the relationship between REM and learning um, there, because otherwise these, these antidepressants would have a powerful side effect, cognitive side effect that we don't see. The other way to do this um, in, in animal studies is to keep an animal REM deprived for months at a time and see if the animal, you know, does the animal show these sort of stress symptoms um, and the, uh, uh, the answer seems to be, well, no, not really. Uh, if, if, you get, if you get sleep, even without REM sleep, the, the, the stress part seems to not be it. Oh, my, my favorite technique for REM depriving a cat in this case. This is the low REM. If you want to REM deprive your cat, here's how you do it. You put the cat, take a flower pot, turn the flower pot upside down, put the cat on the flower pot in the middle of a little artificial lake. Right? Eventually, the cat goes to sleep. Right? Then the cat falls into REM sleep. Falls off. Into the water. Cat doesn't like to fall into the water. Cat wakes up. Um, and, the, uh, uh, and the cat learns um, to not go into REM sleep. And, and uh, apparently, it trains its, in some sense, trains itself not to fall into REM sleep with the result that um, you can REM deprive the cat for an extended period of time. And this is a very weird study. I don't know where they got their measurement. But the only thing I can remember that, the only thing they found that was unusual about this cat is that a normal cat, with got the cat food, if you put a July the 4th kind of sparkler in the cat food, a normal cat will not eat the cat food. But a REM deprived cat will. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I don't know nothing about this. I, I only know what I read in the literature. Um, which reminds me, however, actually this should have reminded me, that the most practical piece of advice, apart from the fact that you should get, um, you know, eight hours of sleep a night, since you won't get eight hours of sleep a night, I know this. I've been lecturing to this course for 20 plus years, and, you know, in spite of my exhortations, that, that, that you know, your, your, your physical and cognitive well-being really relies on you going to sleep at night. None of you are going to pay the slightest bit of attention to that. So the more practical piece of advice I can give you is how to sleep in class. Um, <laughs> the trick is, I mean, obviously what you want to do is, is, is you want to sleep in class in a way that kind of masks that, that, that fact. And, and the difficulty is this REM sleep business. Right, there, there's, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is, is the muscle tone thing, right, and it, 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 it's, the, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's the head bob portion of the, <laughs> um, uh, so I, I can look out there and watch, watch the whiplash, and, and, um, and so that, that, that's, that's not, that's, that's not going to work, so, what people, what, what people figure out on their own is that, that the, what, what you want to do is you, you want to give the illusion that what I or, or somebody else is saying is, is so deep that, that you have to close your eyes to think about it. Um, now, there are a couple of important principles here. Um, one of them is that it's, it's less convincing um, that you're thinking deeply about this if your mouth falls open. <laughs> you're dro- if you're drooling, it's really bad. But so, so you know, this this is good. You know, support support for the chin is good. Um, and and um, the other thing that that you you, you learned in, in like 801 right was that three-legged stools stand better than two-legged ones right. Um, and, and and so you know, I, I favor the. <laughs> Yeah, the, the really, this, this is, I'm really thinking very hard about what you're saying. That, that, that can actually be quite, in fact, you're not fooling anybody. You know perfectly well you're sound asleep. Um, well, what? Oh, oh, keeping the airway open is good. Too. Oh, that was that, the winner of the most embarrassing moment in, um, in uh, intro psych student uh, experience. Um, well, this was actually the, the first year I was teaching the course. I was co-teaching it with, 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 with uh, another guy in, in, in Course 9 at the time, and, and he was lecturing. Um, 
I've long ago stopped figuring that this was an editorial comment when people fall asleep. But anyway, somebody sitting right about over there fell sound asleep. <laughs> but they felt that nobody was sitting next to them. They fell sound asleep and they started to snore. <laughs> and eventually this got like loud enough that my, my colleague had to say, somebody going you want the definition of embarrassed. The, the definition of embarrassed is you're sitting in lecture, everybody's looking at you, and you have no idea why. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that, that's right. With that, so sitting next to somebody is another good strategy if you're actually trying to stay more or less alert. I'm, my, my, my old doctoral advisor and I had this as a, uh, um, uh, as a pact when, when I was in graduate school during the Friday afternoon, terrible time, um, departmental colloquia, we would sit next to each other, and if it was actually a talk that we cared about, we had a, an agreement that, you know, if I go out, you know, poke me, because I kind of want to know what this guy is talking about. Um, which was, he, he was department chair. It turns out to be very important, because one of the rules of your department chair is you have to be able to um, ask a, an intelligent question at the end of the talk. Really good department chairs can do that after sleeping through the talk. But and my advisor, who was otherwise an exemplary department chair, um, was caught up short on this uh, at one talk where he uh, asked a, 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 a very good question, but one that he wouldn't have asked had he been awake for those 20 minutes of the talk because um, the guy had discussed this matter extensively. So we, we would poke each other to, to, to stay awake. Guy joined our lab and he sat two seats away from me. He went out cold. That's okay. But he started shouting. <laughs> in Japanese. <laughs> Actually, it was probably a bonus that it was in Japanese because whatever he was shouting was incomprehensible to anybody else. Um, and you know, I, I, I made this sort of dramatic lunge to get to it before he could manage to get out, you know, too much. Um, but uh, but you know, it's, 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 it, so now if you're worried about that, you kind of want to be sitting with your friends here so that when you start talking in your sleep, somebody can get to you before it becomes really uh, really desperately obvious. Um, all right, the, uh, I suppose the bottom line is that, um, that sleep deprivation will not kill you, um, but it won't do anything it won't do anything good for you except perhaps getting you through the uh, through your work. Now let's see. do I want to you know this looks like uh, a, a, a pretty good a pretty good place to entertain questions. Um, and we'll go on to dreaming uh, a after Thanksgiving. A any, any, any sleep questions while we're here? We got a question. Then you can run for it. So I heard about the sleep cycle 90 minutes. Can you time how long sleep to multiple 90 minutes more effective? Uh, well, the, the piece of that that, that is, is right. Is that, so the question is, does, do you want to sleep in cycles of 90 minutes? Ideally, you want to wake up on your own, typically out of the end of a REM stage, is what would be what would normally happen. Um, and, and yes, you will tend to feel more refreshed there than if you wake up out of, out of, out of this. But most of us, um, you know, wake up when the alarm clock goes up and, oh, sorry. But if you can manage to adjust that to wake you up, you know, even if you have to move it a little earlier, you may feel better if you're waking yourself up out of a, a, a REM state. Um, yep. Oh, uh, that, 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 that's the, the, the neck bobbing thing. And when, you're, when your muscles are going, uh, if you, when, when you're losing muscle tone and, 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 and drifting off into a REM state, you know, bits of you are kind of going where gravity wants it to go, and that, that can feel like a, a, a falling sensation, which inconveniently can sometimes lurch you back away, or conveniently if you happen to be going out during class. Um, but I think that's typically a, a, an effect of losing, of, of the losing muscle tone part. All right, oh, 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 last chance, here we go. How are humans behaving when they're perfected by living in really, really northern latitudes where there's extra like yeah. Oh, wait, if you live in really, really northern, sleep disorders go up as, as, as latitude goes up, um, or way down. Um, but um, as, as long as you're living someplace where the sun comes up every day, that's not an issue. But yes, absolutely, if you go and live someplace where it's dark, for six months of the year, people have disruptions of their circadian 
uh, clock and they start free running. All right, drive carefully, have a good vacation.